So good morning, everyone. It's with pleasure I introduce our speakers today, Rabbi Michael Pollack and Beth Taylor. Michael co-founded March on Harrisburg as a result of sitting in jail following arrest for nonviolent civil disobedience during the Democracy Spring March on Washington in 2016. Michael grew up in Rockville, Maryland, and now lives in South Philly. For the UUs here this morning, you might want to know if you're going to General Assembly in June, Michael will be giving a talk there called Building a Statewide Nonviolent Democracy Movement. In Michael's spare time, he enjoys convincing politicians to not be corrupt, long marches through the Pennsylvania countryside, and sitting down in inconvenient places in the state capitol. Um, and our Beth Taylor is our communications guru for March on Harrisburg. She is also a Unitarian Universalist living in Allentown, PA. Beth attends Lancaster Theological Seminary where she is working her way toward being ordained as a UU minister. In Beth's spare time, she enjoys collecting crystals, <laughs> houseplants, and she loves making any type of art. Welcome, Michael and Beth. Welcome, everybody. It is good to be here. Uh, we were here five years ago uh, when we were doing a statewide tour of Unitarian Universalist congregations, and it is uh, certainly good to be back, um, and welcome. We are March on Harrisburg. We are a statewide, nonpartisan, volunteer-driven, anti-corruption, pro-democracy organization. We fight to make corruption illegal and build a world where we can all thrive. Over the last six years, we have marched 298 miles, Philly to Harrisburg twice, Lancaster to Harrisburg once, and we did York to Harrisburg last uh, fall. We have lobbied our 253 state legislators many times over, totaling in, into the thousands of meetings at this point. We've conducted over 35 nonviolent direct actions, and we have grown the democracy movement across Pennsylvania. We have helped force five committee hearings on gerrymandering. We've helped move open primaries through the full Senate. In 2019, we helped pass vote by mail and shorten the registration deadline from 30 days to 15 days. And we have moved the gift ban out of its committee twice now. And we will soon move it out for a third and final time. So this slide is just designed to create a little credibility here. Um, the forces of corruption in Harrisburg, uh, they don't like us. We fight their corruption. They have called us things like moronic, spoiled two-year-olds. Uh, a mega lobbyist in Harrisburg has nicknamed me the rabid rabbi, and that's what the lobbying firms like to refer to me as. Uh, the current House Majority Leader nicknamed me a militant Hebrew school teacher, uh, which I, I want that one on my tombstone. Um, <laughs> And we've generally just been referred to as those disgusting people. That's a direct quote from uh, Elevator Conversation on September 12th, uh, back in the fall. We know the forces of corruption don't like us. That's okay. That is okay. We know what makes them cheer. It's corruption. We know what makes them boo, and that's democracy. We're okay with that. We understand what we're up against as far as entrenched systemic corruption goes. The former Speaker of the House's Chief of Staff once said bluntly, you all may be marching on Harrisburg to pass the gift ban, but do you know who's marching on Harrisburg to stop it? Every single lobbyist in this city. We are up against an entrenched system of corruption, and we are here to dismantle it. We're going to tell the truth today, and it's not a pleasant truth. It's a very uncomfortable truth. We're going to pull back the curtain on how corruption works, how our political system operates. We're going to show those inner workings of corruption. We're going to show how democracy is subverted and short-circuited. We're going to show how private money is translated into public power, and how that public power is used to make a return on investment for that private money. 
we want you to learn today about systemic corruption and democracy. We want you to get angry, but it is not enough to get angry. More than that, we want you to get active. And a lot of you already are, people watching online, we want you to organize. We want you to jump into the fight. As Dr. King said, history has taught it is not enough for people to be angry. The supreme task is to organize and unite people so that our anger becomes a transformative force. We want you all to join the democracy movement. That's the point of this tour. By the way, this is the fifth event of 31 events across the state from two weeks ago through June 19th in Westmoreland County. We want, this is an organizing tour, not just an education tour. So corruption has been with us in Pennsylvania for quite some time. We're not gonna come up here and pretend like this is a new problem. It gets better, it gets worse, there's ups, there's downs. But let's kind of root ourselves in our history here for a moment. Uh, Alexander Hamilton came through Philadelphia in 1794. He had a particularly upsetting experience, and this is what he wrote in his diary that night. The political putrefaction of Pennsylvania politics is greater than I had any idea of. Let that be a guiding quote for today. We're gonna fast forward 100 years here. This is former US Senator Boise Penrose. This is a statue of his that stands in the Capitol complex in Harrisburg. The joke is, is that in this statue, this is the only time his hand has ever been in his own pocket. <laughs> Boise Penrose was a political machine boss. He ran Pennsylvania politics around the turn of the century. He was an enemy of workers, an enemy of immigrants, an enemy of women, of black people, basically anybody except for his oligarch campaign donors, the J.P. Morgans, the Mellons, the Carnegies of his time. He once told his oligarch campaign donors, whoops, sorry, he once told them this quote right here, I believe in the division of labor. You send us to Congress, we pass laws under which you make money, and out of your profits, you further contribute to our campaign funds to send us back again to pass more laws to enable you to make more money. And that's the name of the game right there. That's Boise Penrose spelling out exactly how this works, right? Money in politics is how people with money buy the political power they need to pass laws to make themselves more money. That is the fundamental driver of our system. And this interaction between private money and public power, that's the definition of corruption. That's what corruption is. And this interaction creates very close relationships between the obscenely rich and our public officials. And this relationship between the bribe givers and the bribe takers excludes everyone else our elected officials become removed and indifferent to us. It says in Deuteronomy, do not take a bribe because a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Reason falls through the cracks when bribery is at play. Doesn't matter what's rational, doesn't matter what's right. Everything gets twisted and distorted. And then that creates a culture of indifference. We have so many words for this in our culture. Uh, the bubble, the swamp, the beltway, right? Those, those words that describe this phenomenon where the bribe givers and the bribe takers hang out together and everybody else is on the outside. They're not seen, they're not heard, they're not served. There's no public service. Isaiah 2,600 years ago said, your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They chase after bribes. The widow and the orphan's cause does not come before them. When bribery is systemic, those who can't pay don't get to play. I just want to take a step back here, a philosophical step back, and understand that every single human being, including all of us in this room, are capable of being corrupt. We're all capable of greed. We're all capable of corruption. It's something that is, exists within humanity. This potential exists in us all, and it's pretty easy to fall victim to it, especially when there is a systemic corruption, especially when this is how the game works. It's not that hard to fall victim to it. And so today, as we go through the rest of this presentation, I just want to make clear, we are not here to condemn any individual 
or any party of individuals. We're not here to say one party is evil and one party is great or this or that about anything. We're here to talk about the system. This isn't about one person, one set of people, one region of people, one party, none of that. This is about draining the swamp. This is about taking on the entire system that we all operate in, the ocean that we all swim in, the swamp that we all get sucked down into. We're here to tell the truth. It's not an easy truth, but let us begin with five, five simple ways to bribe a legislator. These are the five biggest ways that money gets into our Pennsylvania state politics. These are five ways to give money to a legislator. The first one we'll go through, and I'm sorry, these, all five of these, these are not rare. These are routine. These are not scandals that happen every once in a while. This is what's happening every single day in front of all of our faces. None of this are loopholes. This is all the law. And let's start with gifts here, and then we'll go into campaign contributions, the revolving door, side jobs, and dark money. In Pennsylvania, it is legal to give any gift to a state legislator. Your local state rep here went to the symphony in Austria last year for about $15,000. Other typical gifts, you know, you got your concert, your sports tickets, your vacations, your whining and dining, um, roof repairs, kids' uh, private school tuition payments, whatever. Doesn't matter. It's all legal and it's all unlimited. The legal definition of lobbying in Pennsylvania includes these words here. Providing any gift, hospitality, transportation, or lodging to a state official or employee for the purpose of advancing the interest of the lobbyist or principal. To simplify that into non-legalese, it's bribery. When you give an item of value to a public official to influence their position, that's called a bribe. That's what that word means in the English language. It's bribery. And when it comes to the gifts, we really do not have a complete picture of how this works. We get little glimpses. What we do know is that 97% of all gifts, at least, go unreported. Our 253 state legislators report receiving only $40,000 a year in gifts. That's all they report. Lobbyists report giving our state legislators over $1.5 million a year in gifts. We know from lobbyists testifying in committee that they have plenty of ways around their reporting thresholds. There's ways that they cheat the system. So we really don't know the scope of the gift economy. We just know that it's definitely bigger than 1.5 million. And the rare glimpses that we get of specific gifts are, are sickening. Um, your local state rep, Rob Mercury, he went to the symphony. He went with Jay Corman. Uh, picture there, our former Senate president, they went together. Um, and that was the kind of trip, actually, that some legislators, other legislators were invited to. And some of them told me, hey, I got the invite to this, and I said no. We said, well done. Good job. <laughs> Another uh, gift that we got a glimpse of last year was uh, our former House Majority Leader, Carrie Benninghoff, went to the rodeo in Wyoming with the uh, gamblers, with a gambling company. Let's talk about the second way here. Campaign contributions. This is the second way to bribe a state legislator. To run for office costs money. That is just a simple reality of running for office. At a minimum, you need to print literature, flyers, hire a couple campaign staffers, go out knock doors. At a maximum, oh, you flood the airwaves, you flood the mailboxes, you have paid canvassers from out of state coming in, knocking doors for, for money. You know, there, there's a huge advantage to raising a whole lot of money and running a campaign. And it costs a lot of money to run a campaign. If you're running for state representative, you're looking at tens of thousands to millions. To be a state senator is hundreds of thousands to millions. To be governor is millions to tens of millions. To be a US representative, millions to tens of millions. US senator, tens of millions to hundreds of millions. And if you want to be president of the United States of America, the price tag is billions. Billions with a B and an S at the end there, billions. So where does this money come from? How do candidates get this money and get that huge advantage that comes with having a whole lot of campaign money? 
Well, they get it from people who have a lot of money. And of course, it's easier to go to one super rich person and ask for one super big check than it is to go to 10,000 people and get you know, a couple dollars each. So this big money fundraising, it happens at big money campaign fundraisers, which are just swanky, swanky affairs. And we've disrupted many of these. There's one the bottom left there that's uh, uh, out in Center County, that's Toft Trees Golf Resort. Senate President Corman was having a fundraiser there. Um, his biggest campaign donors actually run that golf course. Uh, top left there, that was Senator Regan, not too long ago, a breakfast fundraiser in Harrisburg. It's good to get your bribery out of the way you know, before you go to work. It's good to drink some mimosas with the lobbyists, you know, get a little tipsy, go in and supposedly legislate for the people. Uh, <laughs> fundraising is a time-consuming activity in Harrisburg. That day, when Senator Regan had that morning fundraiser, there were eight other fundraisers on the calendar that day. Uh, last September, after we marched into Harrisburg, um, that week, that session week, this legislature took 17 total votes and had 20 total campaign fundraisers. They, take, they have more fundraisers than they take votes. Big money campaign fundraising is inherently corrupting. Public officials are dependent on those campaign funds to get and to keep their jobs. And so let's listen for a second to a very young Senator Joseph R. Biden. This is about a year into his first term in the US Senate. He became a senator in his 20s. And this was right after Watergate. And this is a public access debate show. And God, I wish shows like this still happened. But a young Senator Biden is going to explain how fundraising works here. The system does produce corruption, and, and I think implicit in the system is corruption, when in fact, whether or not you can run for public office, and it costs a great deal of money to run for the United States Senate, even from a small state like Delaware, uh, you have to go to those people who have money, and they always want something. Well, I wonder whether you would feel that there's some virtue in forcing candidates to go out and try to raise money. I've heard people, probably people who didn't run for office, say that it's uplifting to go out and try to get money. Do you think that there's something Unuplifting about putting a limit to how much you can ask one man to give you? I think it's the most degrading experience in the world to have to go out and ask for money because you know that unless you accidentally agree with the position taken by the person or group that has the money, that you run the risk of deciding whether or not you're going to prostitute yourself to give the answer you know they want to hear in order to get funded to run for that office. And uh, it's coincidental in many instances uh, when in fact you happen to agree with where they are. And you run the risk, by the way, of rationalizing, of saying, well, if I compromise on this one, give them one, I get 90% of what I want, and I don't have to give in too much. So you in Pennsylvania, we have no limits on state campaign contributions. Billionaires like Jeffrey Yass can cut massive checks to whoever they want. There's plenty of legislators who have one or two big donors, and that's the reason they're there. A friend of mine, in, uh, not too far from here, ran for state rep uh, last cycle. And he told me that he got a call one night early in his campaign. And the voice on the other line said, I will give you $300,000 if you are anti-union and anti-public school. And this guy said no. And he lost. If he had said yes, he'd be in Harrisburg right now. Campaign financing makes you make a deal with the devil. That's the system we're in. It makes you compromise your public service, your ideals, for private gain from big money special interests. The third corruption in our system that we're going to go over today is the revolving door. The revolving door is the term we use for lobbyists who become legislators and legislators and their staff who become lobbyists. And they go back and forth between that revolving door from public service to private profit, back and forth, back and forth. And it's dizzying. Every lobbying firm in Harrisburg is staffed with former legislators and their staffers. Um, Paul Costa, he was a rep around here, right? He's, he's now a lobbyist in Harrisburg. Um, and he, he works with our former Republican Senate President, Corman. Uh, it's, they're bipartisan to the, to the core. This is a, a, a clip here from 60 Minutes where former DC mega lobbyist Jack Abramoff is going to explain just how devastatingly effective 
the revolving door is. Just how effective it is when you go into a staffer's office and you say, what do you make, 50,000 a year? You got a quarter million student debt hanging over your head from law school. I make 600,000 a year. Maybe one day you could do my job. Right, so here's Abramoff explaining how effective it is to say those words. But the best way to get a congressional office to do his bidding, he says, was to offer a staffer a job that could triple his salary. When we would become friendly with an office and they were important to us, and the chief of staff was a competent person, uh, I would say, or my staff would say to him or her at some point, you know, when you're done working on the Hill, we'd very much like you to consider coming to work for us. Now, the moment I said that to them, or any of our staff said that to them, that was it. We owned them. And what does that mean? Every request from our office, every request of our clients, everything that we want, they're going to do. And not only that, they're going to think of things we can't think of to do. Jack Revolving door is devastatingly effective. And in Harrisburg, it spins so fast. Just a couple quick examples from our last governor's administration. His chief of staff retired early to go become an Amazon lobbyist. His former acting health secretary resigned early to go become a UPMC lobbyist. And it just generally raises the question, were they working their current public job or were they auditioning for their future private job? And if you follow the policies that the outcomes, the story becomes pretty clear. But you may be thinking, well, if you're a legislator, why wait until you're not a legislator to work a side job? Because in Pennsylvania, side jobs are completely legal for our state legislators. The starting salary for a state representative is over $100,000 a year. They get an incredible pension, incredible benefits, health benefits for them and their families. They get a state car. They only work about 45 days a year. That's about all that they're in session for. This is a full-time legislature. And they can still work side jobs with obvious conflicts of interest. Um, a state rep from this area, DeLuca, who just passed away recently, he would always go on and on about this. This was the thing he cared about the most. He would say, I walk into these, these meetings with my colleagues and I don't know who they work for. I don't know who they're representing in that. I can't trust them. I just don't know what to do. He would get so worked up about this, and he always wore his crushed velvet suits, and he just, it was a scene. So here's just a couple examples of side jobs uh, with obvious conflicts of interest. Uh, there in the top left, you'll see uh, state, our former Senate president, uh, Jake Corman's office, being stalked by vultures. Uh, they are coming in for the putrefaction of Pennsylvania politics there. Uh, Senate President Corman was also on the board of Old Dominion Bank while he was Senate president. He was a bank board member while he was in charge of the Pennsylvania State Senate. You'll see bottom right there, that's former Speaker Mike Terzai. Uh, he, that's him actually, he reached for the megaphone and Selva put it right behind their head. And it's really funny to see a politician reach for a microphone and not get it. Uh, it, is, it just blows their minds, uh, they, they can't handle it. Um, and he panicked that day actually and came out in support of the gift ban. Uh, so Terzai, while he was Speaker of the House, he was also a corporate lawyer representing Fortune 500 corporations. He's both a corporate lawyer and Speaker of the House at the same time. And then uh, top right there, so Senate Pres I'm sorry, our current Senate Environmental Chair, Gene Yaw, is a practicing attorney for gas companies. That's his side job. He's in charge of the Senate Environmental Committee, and he's a practicing attorney for gas, com for gas companies. And that picture there is actually not Gene Yaw. That's our very own Reverend Tim. This was from back in June. Uh, Tim and, eight other, and seven other people walked into Yaw's office and gave him a choice. Resign as chair of the Senate Environmental Committee or resign as a practicing attorney for gas companies. You, you can't be both. Yaw chose to hide behind police and have Reverend Tim and seven others arrested for just having the audacity to make that demand. The fifth way that we'll cover tonight, today, is dark money. And we really don't have much to say about this one because there really isn't much that's known. Dark money is untraceable. We don't know where it comes from. We don't really know how much of it is out there. Our US Supreme Court decided a couple years ago that money is speech and corporations are people. And so corporations have the freedom of speech to speak the way they do, which is through spending money. 
It says, don't, don't overthink this one. It's a very convoluted logical loop that just gets you to bribery is legal. That's the end result. Corporations can spend money to influence politics. So dark money often shows up in the forms of uh, uh, attack ads, nasty mailers that come in your mailbox three days before the election. They have names on them like Pennsylvanians United for Pennsylvania, or Pittsburghers for Justice, or United Democracy Project. Right? And they're just shell corporations. They rise, they fall, they disappear once they've done what they need to do. And we really have no sense of the full scope of, of what's out there with dark money. It's a really also effective way to punish or protect legislators from the shadows. You can do it, you can attack them, you can support them, they'll never know. Gifts, campaign contributions, future revolving door jobs, side jobs, dark money, and more, right? These are just the five easiest ways, there's more. All of this adds up to corruption. This all adds up to our government being responsive to and dominated by large corporate special interests. A meeting room in Harrisburg looks like this, may as well. The interests of Shell are there, the interests of Amazon, and so on. And I don't think this is new information for people here, what I'm saying here. I think that most people, we kind of know this deep in our hearts. We, we, we have this gut feeling already. Politicians are out in it for themselves. There's corruption. The swamp is, you know, it's, it's a thing. Um, and, and polling kind of backs that up, that we all kind of have this feeling already. We, we know this. Uh, Franklin and Marshall, saw you wearing the Franklin and Marshall shirt back there. They do fantastic political polling. And they set out, they uh, put out a poll question. Um, how many Pennsylvanians think, quote, there is little corruption in government? Anybody want to take a guess? What percentage of Pennsylvanians think that there is little corruption in government? Oh, it's up there? 11. <laughs> uh, only 11. Only 11%, as you all know, as you've all seen. Only 11% of Pennsylvanians think there is little corruption in government. And I think those 11% are lobbyists and legislators, because I've never met anybody outside of the Capitol building who thinks bribery is OK or that it's you know, a thing that should happen. We don't trust our government here in Pennsylvania, and that's not unique to Pennsylvania. In nationwide polling, when Pew asked the question, do you trust your government to do the right thing all or most of the time? About 20% of Americans trust our government. 20%, that's where we are nationally. Right, it feels high, <laughs> and it's, it's going down. This chart on the right there, the second chart, that shows U.S. congressional re-election rates. And those are generally over 90%. So what does that mean that less than 20% of us trust our government, and yet we're re-electing them at a 90% plus rate? What does it mean that we don't trust our government, but we keep re-electing the same people? We know they're corrupt, so why is it so hard to vote them out? We know our government is working for oligarchs and large corporate special interests, and yet we can't seem to get rid of them. Our government fails us again and again and again, year after year after year after year, and yet we can't get rid of these people who keep failing. We don't seem to be able to move past them. My God, I, the, one of my favorite shows, The Simpsons, is now in its 34th season, and I was watching some season two episodes and it's all the same issues we have today. Same exact issues. They're talking about immigration reform. They're talking about unfair tax burdens. They're talking about wages going down, unions being cut. Same issues we're facing. Nothing changes. It just kind of slides downward. So why can't we fire the people who fail us so consistently? So let's talk about divide and conquer politics. This is a political cartoon where the advisor to the king is explaining, you don't need to actually end the grift, you don't, the graft. You don't need to actually stop oppressing the serfs and taking you know, all of their stuff and, and, and oppressing them and profiting off of their labor. You don't need to stop any of that. You just need to turn the pitchfork people against the torch people. And if you can do that, the scam keeps going. The game keeps going. Our system is fueled by corrupt money, and we all know it. 
And we the people are constantly frustrated at the ballot box through divide and conquer structural things, things that are built into our system. And it leaves us frustrated, it leaves us bewildered, it leaves us at each other's throats, blaming some poor and marginalized group of people for whatever the problems are. And it keeps us from storming the castle and ending the king's game. Four ways here that we are structurally divided and conquered. One, gerrymandering. And I know some people in this room have put a lot of work into gerrymandering reform. Two, closed primaries. Three, winner-takes-all elections, the cure for which is ranked choice voting. And four, the authoritarian rules that our House and Senate are governed by. These four things, plus the influence of big money, divide and conquer Pennsylvanians, subvert democracy, and make accountability at the ballot box extremely rare, extremely rare. Gerrymandering is when politicians pick their voters. Our state legislature draws the district lines for state legislative districts. There's so many cartoons out there where the fox is just sitting in the hen house. You know, that, that's basically what it is. That's our setup. The legislators get to draw their own districts through their partisan leadership. And in gerrymandered districts, they become non-competitive. And let's play a guessing game here. This one's not up there, right? Yeah, okay, let's play a guessing game. <laughs> That number on the bottom right in 2022, right, so I'm sorry, so first, the 228 number. Every year in Pennsylvania, every two years in Pennsylvania, there are 228 legislative elections. All 203 of our state representatives are on the ballot, and half of our 50 senators are on the ballot every two years. Our senators have four year terms. Every two years, half of them are up, up on the ballot. So there's 228 legislative elections every two years in Pennsylvania. So how many of those 228 in 2022 do you think were competitive? And competitive means within 10 points. So 55, 45 or closer. Six. Who else? It's not that low. <laughs> 20. 20. 10%. Okay, 20. That's about the same. Yep. Yeah. 21. 9%. 9% of our general elections were somewhat competitive. 9%. Right? Gerrymandering creates a two-party cartel setup. And I'm using that word cartel very intentionally here. That's what this is called in economic terms. When two entities divide turf between them and have non-competitive agreements. You have your turf, I have my turf. We'll battle it out in the middle on the buffer zones. And so in Pennsylvania, in our state legislature, it's divided, we're all conquered, and they duke it out over a couple uh, swing districts every, every couple of years. Um, we're in one, actually. Uh, the, the new representative here just won a very close election, and that's gonna be a swing district for a long time. And the campaign financing in that race was off the charts. Money came in from all over the state and all over the country, because only a small number of elections actually matter. And so the big money folks, they know that, and they flood the zone with, with, with big money. Uh, on the presidential level, we call this non-competitive phenomenon the electoral college. Uh, we happen to live in one of the 12 states where presidential candidates spend 99% of their money and 97% of their time. Presidential candidates do not go to Arkansas. They do not go to Maryland. They don't go to Delaware. They don't go to Utah. They go to 12 states. 99% of their t money and 97% of their time. Anybody want to guess what's the difference between those two numbers? Why is it 99% of their money goes into 12 states, but only 97% of their time goes into 12 states? What's the gap there? Size of the state. Say it again? Size of the state. No. Fundraising. You gotta to go to the fundraising centers. So that 2% difference there is going to Miami, Florida, Chicago, Illinois, Atlanta, Georgia, Dallas, uh, Houston, and Texas, Los Angeles, the Bay Area, and California. Those are the big fundraising centers. So politicians, presidential candidates jet out there, they raise their big money, they come back to these 12 states and they eat corn dogs at the county fair and flood the airwaves with, with nonsense. Right, so if gerrymandering makes general elections non-competitive for the most part, right, there's a couple every year, that really raises the question of the primary election, right? The primary becomes all the more important. And so if you look at primary elections, the next question is who votes in them? 
What's, what's the structure there? What's the system there with primaries that we're all, we're all operating in? And it's a system of closed primaries. In Pennsylvania, you have to be a registered member of the party to vote in that party's election. In uh, gerrymandered districts, the primary is the only one that matters. And so if you're not part of the majority party, your vote really doesn't matter. We have 1.23 million Pennsylvanians who are registered independents or registered members of third parties. They do not get to participate in primaries except for ballot questions. If there's any registered independents here, still show up to vote on ballot questions. Um, but they don't get to vote for the candidates. And that's about 14% of, of, our, of our population there that just don't participate in primary elections. And we know that the independent rate would actually be much higher if we had open primaries. National polling shows over 40% of Americans consider themselves independents. That's more than both parties. Over 40% of Americans consider themselves independents. And in states with open primaries, the independent rate is about that high. In Alaska, where they have open primaries, the rate's 55%. 55% of Alaskans are registered independents because they have open primaries and ranked choice voting. Here in Pennsylvania, with our closed primary system, a lot of us, statistically speaking, about 30% of us, are registered with a party that we don't want to be part of, just so that we can have a vote that actually counts in the primary. So to become, so our system discourages independents and third party members from just existing. And it makes people join a party that they'd rather not be a part of in order to have a meaningful vote. So we've talked about who votes and what lines, districts they vote in. Let's talk about how we vote for a second, because how we vote is just as important, and it's incredibly impactful. The way we vote now makes absolutely no sense. We have what's called a winner-takes-all system, and that means that you can win an election without having a majority of support. It happens all the time. You see on the left there, a winner-takes-all system. The winning candidate there has 44% of the vote. In a majority system, you have to win a majority. You have to have 50% plus one in order to win. And that's what the chart on the right shows, a majority style election. The way we vote now, voters choose one candidate and whichever candidate gets the most votes wins. Doesn't matter if they have less than 50%. We all go in and we select one candidate. This is a ballot that I'm gonna be voting on because I'm coming to you from Philly. Uh, this is the Philadelphia Democratic primary mayoral ballot. Whoever wins this primary is going to be the mayor of Philadelphia. The general election is non-competitive, as it is in most cases. And that ballot on the left is the ballot that we're going to be using. And you see there's 12 candidates on there. And we have to go in and choose one. And one of them might win with 8.6% with of the vote. We could have a Philadelphia mayor who won 8.6% of the vote in a closed primary, and that's their mandate to govern. With ranked choice voting, you see it on the, on the right there, that's, that's what a ranked choice voting ballot looks like. You go in and you rank your candidates. You say, this is my number one, this is my number two, this is my number three, as many as you want to do. And then there's an instant runoff election that happens. And so if nobody has 50% plus one, last place gets lopped off, and whoever voted for them as their first choice, the voter's vote goes to their second choice. It's a runoff election that happens instantly. Unlike in Georgia where you have to come back two months later and you know, it's a whole hassle. Ranked choice voting, it's, it's happening in the voting machine and it's very safe and secure. And when you have ranked choice voting, you know, I'm a Philadelphia voter, I'm gonna go in and look at that ballot on the left in a couple weeks and I'm gonna have to do these mental gymnastics Okay, I like that candidate the most, but that candidate doesn't have a chance of winning. Okay, so my second favorite candidate, I like them a little bit, but that other candidate down there, I really don't want them to win. But they might win if I vote for this one instead of this one. And then if I do that, then this other one might win. And so you have to play these games where you try to game out, okay, how are all the voters going to vote? You don't know. Who knows, right? You don't know until election day is over. And by the way, the polls that are out for the Philly Dem primary were all paid for by one of the candidates. So who can trust that? Who knows, who knows what's happening, right? And so the, the way we vote now with our winner-takes-all system, it lets buffoonish cartoon characters, TV charlatans, it lets them get through the door. 
It encourages people who campaign with a lot of money aimed at a partisan base because you don't need to appeal to a majority of voters. You don't need to. Our last president did not win a primary election with a majority of votes. He ran against a divided field and he divided and conquered and played to a hyperpartisan base and that's how he won. This guy on the screen here is a great example of this. In the 2022 Pennsylvania U.S. Senate primary, 31.2% of people voted for Oz. 68.8% of people voted for someone else, one of the other six candidates. We know that Oz would not have won a ranked choice voting election because more voters in that primary, when polls asked, do you like this candidate or do you not like this candidate, more voters could not stand his guts. In opinion polling, 46% of likely voters in that election had an unfavorable view of him, while only 40, 41%, uh, sorry, 40% liked him. How does a candidate win when more voters dislike them than like them? That is a structural, hyperpartisan, divide and conquer setup that we have here. And so what happened was Oz won the primary with less than 1,000 votes in a six-way race, in a seven-way race. Even though more voters hated his guts than liked him, he won. And this happens all the time. But to give a counterexample, to jump over to Alaska again, where they have open primaries and ranked choice voting, they had a congressional election recently where Sarah Palin lost. And I'm throwing her into the same category of buffoonish cartoon characters. Right? More voters had an unfavorable opinion of her than favorable, just like Oz, and she lost. She lost. The voters picked a middle-of-the-road person. She would have won without ranked choice voting, but she lost. Let's take a second to talk about the spoiler effect here, too. Right? Ranked choice voting, it frustrates voters. It also frustrates non-major parties, because if you run as a third party, you are liable to become a spoiler in our current system. And in a typical gerrymandered district, let's say the one on the left there, 60-40 split, locked in majority, it's gonna be a non-competitive general election most of the time. If you add a third party in there that chips away at either one of their base, the minority, we gotta flip the colors on this slide, but the minority party might uh, win the election. So in a heavily democratic district, if a working families party or a green party candidate jumps in, it might split some votes, and then all of a sudden the Republican wins and the whole district is just unhappy. That's called the spoiler effect. It happens all the time and it locks out third parties and independents from participating. How we vote matters. It matters. And the benefits of ranked choice voting are clear. One, it ensures majority support. You can't just campaign at your small base and expect to skate by in a crowded field. You can't do it. You have to appeal to a majority of voters, which sounds so simple, doesn't it? Isn't that just kind of basic stuff? You should appeal to a majority of voters to win the election. How is that not our, yeah. Ranked choice voting also decreases toxic campaigning and partisanship. There's this phenomenon in areas with ranked choice voting where candidates sometimes will actually film commercials together and they'll say, hey, I'm Sue and this is Bob. Vote for me as your number one, but if you don't, please put me as your number two. And then Bob jumps up and says, hey, vote for me as your number one, but if you don't, put me as your number two. We both agree on uh, school funding you know, as a core issue, but we're different in this way, in this way, in this way. And that cooperative campaigning, I mean, just imagine that. <laughs> imagine cooperative campaigning, it's, it's phenomenal. They actually talk about issues when it's a ranked choice voting election. It's not just playing to a, a, a TV reality show kind of uh, you know, campaign style. It takes out the lesser of two evils voting. On my Philadelphia mayoral ballot, I don't have to think about which candidate I want to prevent from winning because they're the worst. I can vote my conscience and it'll shake out appropriately. Ranked choice voting increases voter engagement because we're not frustrated and bewildered as much. We get to actually go and express our choices in a clear, coherent way. It's incredible. It also increases representation of people of color and of women, because in a crowded field, the first people bullied off the ballot every single time are women and people of color. That's just the way it happens. There's 12 people on the field. The first person to drop off the Philly uh, mayoral ballot just happened this week was uh, Quinona Sanchez. She said, I can't compete. 
Uh, she was definitely bullied off, and there was also a campaign financing reason. She looked at the two millionaires in the race and just went, I, I, can't, I can't compete with that. that. That's too much. Second guy to drop off the ballot this week was Derek Green, a, a black man in, in Philadelphia. Um, people who get bullied off the ballot tend to be women and people of color. Uh, when New York City Council started using ranked choice voting, their representation, their diversity went through the roof overnight. Ranked choice voting, it's not the cure-all, none of this is. Um, but let's, let's move into the next part here, the rules. We have a structural, hyper-partisan, authoritarian setup within our legislature. Right? We've already discussed who draws the lines with gerrymandering, who does and who does not get to vote in the all-important primary elections with our closed primaries. We've discussed how we vote with winner-takes-all elections and how harmful that is. But now let's take a moment to talk about what it looks like when they get to the legislature and how the legislature internally operates. For a bill to become a law, raise your hand if you had a civics class growing up. I'm just curious. Yeah. It's often a generational distinction there. Civics has just kind of been cut over time. It's interesting. Uh, for a bill to become a law, it constitutionally needs to pass four votes. It needs to pass out of its House committee. It needs to pass a full vote on the House floor. It needs to pass out of its Senate committee. And it needs to pass through the full Senate. And then the governor can sign it into law or not sign it into law. So those four votes are very difficult to make happen. The hardest part is not actually winning those votes. That's the easy part, to get 102 representatives to say yes out of 203, to get 26 out of 50 senators to say yes. That's the easiest part of the whole process. The hardest part is to get those votes to even happen, to get them to even happen. The power to schedule those four votes is held by six people. For any one bill, six people control the four votes that it takes. Those six people are well-funded. They dole out campaign contributions to their colleagues. They're hyper-partisans. They're generally in a very safe district where they'll never be challenged in a district that they drew for themselves. And they're, they're seniors. They're, they've been there a long time. Committee chairs are determined by seniority. And so you have this combination of being uh, in a very partisan setup, in a well-funded setup, and, and those folks are the gatekeepers. So this is for the gift ban bill, the six, uh, the, the six people who control the four votes that we need. So first, the House State Government Committee chair controls every th vote that comes up in the House State Government Committee. The vote, second vote on the House floor is determined by the House Majority Leader and the Speaker of the House. The vote in the Senate Committee is controlled by the Senate Committee chair. And the vote on the Senate floor is controlled by the Senate Majority Leader and the Senate President. Those six people control those four votes. And if any one of those six people says no, it's dead. It's done. Try again next year. Good luck. If one powerful legislator out of 253 legislators says no, try again next year. So it constitutionally takes four votes, but we got to add a little wrinkle in here. There's two secret votes that happen along the way. They're called the caucus, the caucus votes. So what'll happen is once a bill comes out of committee, before it goes to the full floor, it goes into the caucus room. And the caucus room is when the majority party, so right now in the House, that's the Democrats, in the Senate, it's the Republicans, they get together behind closed doors with no official transcripts, no cameras, no note takers, no nothing. There's no public transparency at all in the caucus room. We have no idea what happens in there, except for what they leak to us, what they tell us happens. And if a majority of the majority doesn't vote in favor in the secret caucus vote, the bill is dead. It does not advance to that next vote. So you have to have a majority of the majority in a secret vote, say okay before it can advance, and that's the caucus room. And the caucus room is a really good way of killing a bill with no accountability. You can't blame one committee chair, you can't blame one majority leader, or one speaker of the house, or one senate president. It goes into the caucus room, it's gone. There's no fingerprints on the body, there's no accountability. It's just done. And we've actually passed the gift ban out of its House State Government Committee twice. 
in 2019 and in 2021. And both times it went into the caucus room and it vanished. We have some insights into the conversations they had in there. We've had some leakers, but not much. And we really don't know what happened. So it's really hard to pass a law in this kind of artificial, hyper-partisan, structural setup within the legislature itself, where these hyper-partisans who are well-funded sit as these powerful gatekeepers. It's very hard to get around them. But we try. We try everything. Oh, my God, March in Harrisburg, we are a crafty group. We are creative. We, Frank right there is probably one of 20 people in this state who's actually read the House rules and understands them. Um, the, it, we're, we're crafty. So <laughs> we tried back in September to pass the gift ban and bypass the gatekeepers who control that second vote, the one on the House floor, to bypass the House Majority Leader and the Speaker of the House. We used a wonky legislative maneuver that hasn't succeeded since 1921. And it's actually the legislative maneuver that ended the reign of Boise Penrose. They say he died from a broken heart shortly afterward. <laughs> His habit of eating 24 eggs at a time did not help. In the words of the press, and they're accurate here, that bottom headline, it was a clandestine plot. That, that's what we were trying to pull off. We were trying to unite the rank and file, to charge the castle, and take down their, their leadership and, and pass an anti-corruption bill. We're crafty, and they failed. The legislature failed. We gave them a very clear opportunity to do the right thing. We pushed them, and in both parties, in both chambers, they came down with a hammer of Thor on this back in September, and they killed it. The first text I got that day from one of our champions in the House was, oh crap, boy is my ass red, oh no. They know it's me. <laughs> the pressure is real, it comes down hard, and they failed back in September. But of course, we're crafty, we're always advancing forward. As uh, Jamal, who's always in the back of our marches, he's a marine uh, drill instructor, he always says, uh, uh, you never retreat, you just uh, advance backward when you need to, and then you advance forward again. So we're always advancing, always advancing. <laughs> so just to make a point here, while well-funded, hyper-partisan gatekeepers have blocked the gift ban so far, it is worth noting that not one of them, not one of them, out of all four public obstructions, public gatekeepers who have jumped up in the way of this bill, not one of them has come back the next session with the same power. And not one of them has lost at the ballot box. Earlier when I said accountability at the ballot box is tough, it's very tough. We, we pursue a different kind of accountability. So first, let's start with a popular local favorite here, former House State Government Committee Chair Daryl Metcalf. Uh, there's some of our folks on the top left there blocking, uh, I believe, his committee room. Um, just a funny aside here, you can kind of see those two on the right there, they're, they're Teamsters. And when you're kind of orchestrating a sit-in uh, to block an area, uh, two Teamsters equals uh, six scrawny activists. Um, that's, that's, that's the exchange rate there. <laughs> right. And so we, we made Metcalf answer for protecting corruption. He was unable to. We drove wedges within the house to the point where former Speaker Terzai wouldn't even say his name out loud and knocked him off the committee. On the right there, Speaker Terzai, there are some of our folks confronting him at the Capitol. I think some people here were actually on his front yard with us a few years ago. Were you there? Yeah. You know, we, we, we dogged him. We went after Terzai, we forced the encounter, we gave him multiple opportunities to, to do the right thing. He consistently chose not to, and he resigned abruptly to become a gas lobbyist. Majority Leader Benninghoff, there we are in the bottom left there, disrupt, disrupting his uh, press club event last year to ask him the simple question, why aren't you passing the gift ban? Why are you protecting corruption? That guy who's ripping the banner away is Jeffrey Yass's bag man. His name is Matt Brulette. He's the one who funnels the billionaire's money all over the state to candidates. Um, and Benninghoff, uh, of course, no accountability at the ballot box, but he lost the majority and he lost his leadership position. So he's no longer in GOP leadership, and uh, his story's going to end soon. Uh, Senator Corman, Senate president, he just resigned to become a lobbyist, got out of the way. Everybody we've put the gift ban in front of, within one session, they have lost their power and, and most of them have just gone home because there's no answer to protecting corruption. There, there's nothing to say. How can you defend bribery? 
Jay Corman, just a quick story. A, a reporter told me once that uh, they called him and, and said, uh, I'd like to talk with you about money and politics. And his response was just, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that kind of thing. Because there's nothing to say. And they know it. We fight hard against corruption and artificial hyperpartisanship, and we are making progress. And we'll talk more about that later. But the first step toward winning is recognizing the playing field that we're on. We have to understand what we're up against. We have to acknowledge the system we live in. And we have to be smart about it. We have to understand. Dr. King wrote, uh, said uh, many years ago, the prescription for the cure rests with the accurate diagnosis of the disease. If we can't properly diagnose our system, we have no hope in fixing it. And the disease is corruption and the artificial hyperpartisanship that keeps us divided and conquered so that corruption can continue. That's the disease we are afflicted with. Let's summarize one more time here. What does this all add up to? It adds up to a reality where we are stuck in a two-party, hyper-partisan system that locks out independents and third parties. It divides turf so that it only has to battle on a small number of swing districts and swing states. It encourages toxic campaigning that writes off a majority of voters from the get-go. Our elected officials are illegally bribed. They're often dependent on those bribes to keep their jobs. And our legislature is governed by obstructionist, hyper-partisan, well-funded gatekeepers. It is an idolatrous government of, by, and for the highest bidder. It follows the wrong golden rule. Instead of love your neighbor as yourself, the golden rule is the guy with the gold makes the rules. And if you look at all the data of what this adds up to, Princeton University in a famous study nine years ago, they looked at political outcomes at the federal level from the 1980s and 1990s. They looked at thousands of outcomes. Okay, this is an issue that's coming before Congress. This is what people think about it. This is what special interests think about it. Here's what happened. And their conclusion, after looking at thousands of, of outcomes, was that the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. That's the cold, hard data right there. We do not live in a system where power is with the people. We don't. Nothing will change until we organize and build the people-powered movement we need to build the democracy we deserve. And so if we could all just turn to the person next to us for a second, introduce yourself if you haven't already, and just kind of take a crack at these three questions, and we'll come back together in a few minutes here. But do you trust our Pennsylvania state government to do what is best for the people of Pennsylvania? It's a pretty obvious question, given what we've just heard. How does it take, make you feel to know that bribery and corruption are legal and systemic? And was any of this surprising? I'm, I'm very curious about that last one. Was any of this surprising? Does, um, so does anybody have anything that they want to share out? If you do, um, we have a microphone coming around, but just anything that you want to share from what you talked about? Yeah, from the pair share, yeah. No? <laughs> I, I, would, I won't go on at length about it, but that we have put together a bill for ranked choice voting to uh, offer it as a uh, local option. So um, uh, you could have it, for example, the executive race in Allegheny County now. So it would be something that counties or cities or towns or even school boards could, uh, to do, could use ranked choice voting with the aim of getting more people familiar with it and then have it at the legislative level and governor, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, so um, Michael took us through uh, some of the issues in the government, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about corruption in our everyday lives and how it affects all of us on very um, real and tangible uh, levels. So how does corruption impact you? How does it impact all of us? So um, I think it's important to recognize that 
We are all hurting on many fronts, and we have problems and crises that pile up year after year, and things just seem to be getting worse. Um, our government makes decisions that favor big money special interests, and those decisions, they hurt all of us. We don't have a, a government capable of solving our problems, and we need to recognize, like I said, that we're all hurting. We are not alone. Um, you are not alone. Um, and, but we're all being governed by absur absurdity. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of corruption connections um, and the ways that they affect us. So we'll start with um, health care. So corruption affects our health care. The fact is the second best parking spot at the state capitol has a sign reading reserved Independence Blue Cross. They have their own parking spot. Um, and insurance companies like Blue Cross and large medical corporations like UPMC and opioid pushers like Purdue um, flood the halls of Harrisburg with armed, they're armed with bribes and they're making sure that they win and we lose. And in, um, in fact, talking about uh, the opioid crisis, over the past 10 years, the opioid industry has had an average of 82 lobbyists in Harrisburg every year. And that's the highest concentration of opioid lobbyists um, in any state capital in the country. So what are the consequences of this? You can look at some statistics. Um, in 2019, 124,900 Pennsylvania children ages 18 and below lacked health care insurance. And right now, 1.2 million Pennsylvanians are losing their Medicaid coverage. So we have, I'm sorry, and there's one more. Um, yes, the. Uh, in, um, sorry, in 2020, around 5,100 Pennsylvanians died from drug overdoses, and this is 42.4 deaths per 100,000 people, and that is the eighth highest mortality rate in the nation. So we have medical debt, no insurance, or insurance that's too expensive for us to actually use. Um, we have a lack of health care providers, hospitals that have closed down in our communities because of greed high prescription drug prices, and deaths from diseases of despair, and more. So I want us all to think about how this might uh, have impacted or continues to impact us in our daily lives. And raise your hand if someone you love has ever been impoverished or hurt by our broken health care system. Right. Yeah, several of us in the room, right? I'm going to take a look at the environment. So corruption causes ecological devastation that hurts all of us and is destroying the planet. The gas industry gives between five to nine million dollars a year in uh, campaign contributions at the state level in Pennsylvania, and they spend that amount every year in lobbying expenses. And to me, this statistic says a lot, um, that there are 203 registered lobbyists for the gas industry, and that comes out to one for every 200, uh, for each of our 200,000 state, 200, each of our 203 state reps. So what are the consequences of this? As I said, it leads to ecological devastation. Um, we poison our air, our land, and water. We have numerous cancer clusters in Pennsylvania, and our air quality is dangerous, and our disease rates are high. Access to clean drinking water and food is a struggle all over the state. We have thousands of uncapped fracking sites leaking methane, and as a state, Pennsylvania produces 1% of the world's greenhouse gases. So I'm sure some of us in this room have been affected by um, this corruption in uh, the environment. And so if you've ever, uh, raise your hand if you or someone you love has ever been affected by these issues and ecological devastation. No. So we take a look at the tax structure. So um, I'm sure we probably all know that the most important thing to all corrupt big money special interests is the tax code. They fight to create loopholes to legally pay less, 
um, while everyone else pays more. And one of the biggest dodges in uh, it, biggest tax dodges is called the Delaware tax loophole, and that means over 70% of large corporations in Pennsylvania avoid taxes by being legally registered in Delaware. So this comes down to, uh, this means that the richest 1% of Pennsylvanians uh, pay a 6% tax rate in all state municipal taxes as a percentage of their total family income. The poorest pay, uh, the poorest 20% pay a 13.8% tax rate for all state municipal taxes. This means that the richest Pennsylvanians pay less than half of what the poorest Pennsylvanians pay. So, Raise your hand if you or someone you love has ever been affected by unfair taxes um, and the unfair tax burden while rich people and large corporations avoid paying their share. Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> and we'll look, take a look at education. Corruption absolutely affects our education system. Pennsylvania billionaire Jeffrey Yass has given $36 million since 2019 to PACs that support what they call educational choice, which is really just code for privatization. The goal in life of Yass and his billionaire buddies um, is to pr privatize our public education system so they can own it and trade it on Wall Street and profit off of it. But for some reason, our politicians cut public education funding and claim that there is no money in the budget for education. Why? Because they refuse to tax rich people and large corporations. Then what happens? Public schools suffer from a lack of funding and privatized charter schools get that funding. The consequences of this are pretty stark. Um, we recently dropped to 45th in the nation in state funding for public schools. There are only five states that are worse than us. Um, and just to think about that, you know, only f we're fifth from the bottom, sixth from the bottom in how much our government funds our, our schools. So we have underfunded schools with too many kids in each classroom, not enough teachers or nurses, librarians or counselors, and other key staff. We have dilapidated schools with asbestos, lead, and dangerous heat and cold. In higher education, we have high tuition costs, massive student debt, and generally, we just don't get the education that we and our loved ones deserve because there just isn't as I would like to say, enough money in the budget um, because it's just politically impossible to tax the rich. So I'd like for you to raise your hand if you or someone you love has ever been affected by this broken education system. Yeah, it's a big one. If you look around the room, a lot of us have our hands raised. So this is pretty bleak stuff, <laughs> um, but we don't need to accept this bleak reality. We don't need to accept the corruption as the, only way po as the only possible way of living. It doesn't need to be this way, and we, we can do better. I'd like us to imagine if we had a government that was capable of solving in the interest of uh, the people of solving a government capable of solving our problems, right, in the interest of the people. Um, imagine if we had a government of, by, and for the people that actually fights for our basic human rights. So this is the promise of democracy, right? In the preamble of the US Constitution, we laid out the five purposes of government where power is inherent in, in we the people. And the preamble reads that we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. So imagine if we had the government that, was lab uh, that is laid out in this preamble Imagine if we had a government dedicated to establishing justice, ensuring domestic tranquility, providing for the common defense, promoting the general welfare, and securing the blessings of liberty. And this rhetoric is lofty. Um, and from the very beginning, the details inside of the Constitution favored 
property over people in many ways. The Constitution as slavery, the Electoral College, elections were only about 5% of the population could vote. Senators were um, not directly elected by voters, and several other structures uh, that prioritized property rights and prevented freedom and liberty. But the story of US democracy is working class movements struggling and winning more and more power for the people, moving us closer and closer to these ideals. From the abolitionists, to the suffragettes, to the labor movement, to the civil rights movement, and more, our story is organizing movements and winning real change. And it's our turn right now to fight for and expand democracy in Pennsylvania. So who here is sick and tired of being sick and tired? Raise your hand, everybody. <laughs> and raise your hand if you are tired of corrupt billionaire funded politicians and the media telling you to just blame the other party or just hate some poor and dispossessed group of people for all of these problems instead of challenging our systemic greed and corruption, right? All of us. So we talked earlier about the divide and conquer strategy um, and it lets greed govern us and it drives, this tactic drives me nuts because it works so well. Um, I see this in my personal life where it has caused divisions um, and estrangement in my family uh, because we're too busy fighting about things that are just um, really culture war driven and we are not, um, you know, and we're actually suffering from greed driven problems like our broken healthcare system. And I'm involved with March on Harrisburg because we work to bring people across those lines of division and become the powerful force that we know we can be. And the truth is um, that if we don't root out and get rid of the corruption in our government, we will never see progress on any of the other issues that you or I care about. And this, these are issues like immigration, housing, mass incarceration, gun violence, public transit, uh, hunger, poverty wages, labor rights, whatever issues that are important to you. What, um, so what we do is empowering and invading the private spaces of smoky backroom politicians and state lobbyists, looking politicians in the eye and telling them, we're not stupid, we see, we see what you're doing, we see your corruption, and we're gonna have, um, we're gonna do everything we can to end it. And so while all of this seems really bleak, that doing that, taking that action, is actually what gives me the energy that I need to fight what can seem like an impossible fight to win. Um, and the people standing united aside of me in this fight are incredible, and they're my community, my friends, and they give me the hope I need. Um, so I'd like you to raise your hand if you're ready to unite together and fight to build a better democracy in Pennsylvania. So we have pledge cards um, to fill out, uh, and um, Andrea is going to go get them. And as we hand those out, we're going to do another pair share. Um, oops. That's the card. <laughs> so we're going to do um, a pair share. And if so, if you want to turn to your neighbor again and just discuss for a couple minutes, how does systemic corporation and the lack of democracy affect you and the people you love? And what could our lives actually look like if we lived in a society where power is inherent to the people and our politicians were responsive to us instead of big money special interests? Let's just take a couple minutes to talk about that. Okay, let's bring it all back together here. We're gonna talk for a few more minutes about uh, who we are, how to get involved. Um, and we are gonna go a few minutes past one o'clock, uh, if that's okay with people. Uh, I don't know why we call this a 90 minute thing. There's <laughs> so much to share. Oh yeah, we're gonna make it. So who we are, sorry. Once again, we are a statewide, nonpartisan, volunteer-driven, pro-democracy, anti-corruption organization. We have, this is our organizational chart here, just to give you a sense of, of how we're structured. We have our board, we have our three staff, we have our four regional chapters, 
and we have our uh, almost a dozen working groups. The board, the staff, the chapters, the working groups all push in the same direction, moving our four campaigns forward together and not one step back. Our four campaigns are uh, gift ban, ranked choice voting, Pennsylvania action on climate, and the Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign. So this is our organizational structure here. Our core value and guiding tactic is nonviolence. And this is an ironic picture of me making a fist at the governor, but uh, it was all nonviolent. <laughs> nonviolence is what Dr. King called the sword that heals. We all have to understand that nobody is going anywhere. Our neighbors are not leaving. Nobody's moving out of the state. We have to live together. And we have to wage peace. We don't wage war, we wage peace. The war is ongoing. The war is between corruption and we the people. We're here to wage peace between we the people and a government that's supposed to be of, by, and for the people. As Gandhi said, this power is not passive. It is extremely active. It calls for intense activity. We are tenacious and relentless and successful in our nonviolence. We use nonviolence because the nature of corruption is that it separates people, right? It, creates, it blinds the eyes of the wise, it twists the words of the righteous, it separates us. And nonviolence forces the encounter. It overcomes that separation. It barges into the smoky back rooms, forces the encounter, and demands a response of service, a response of love. As the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas once said, when you see the face of the other, you are ordered and ordained to service. And that response to our suffering faces of service is what we're looking for. That's the goal. And we force the encounter and we make them respond, either with public service or with private greed. And we give them that choice. And if they choose right, great, we throw a party. If they choose wrong, we force the encounter again and again and again and again until they just go home and retire, which as we saw in the last segment, that's what's happened to all four gatekeepers so far. All of our tactics stem from nonviolence, lobbying, marching, nonviolent direct action, leadership development, organizing. So our five core tactics and they all stem from nonviolence. Gandhi said, uh, uh, first they fight you, I'm sorry, first they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. That's how nonviolence works. They're done laughing. They've been done laughing for a few years now. They're fighting. So soon we'll win. <laughs> March on Harrisburg has four active campaigns. Once again, gift ban, ranked choice voting, Pennsylvania action on climate, poor people's campaign. These are our four campaigns. First campaign here, let's just talk briefly, gift ban again. We have been fighting this since uh, 2017. We have conducted over a thousand lobbying meetings. We've marched hundreds of miles. We've conducted dozens of nonviolent direct actions. Um, that picture on the left was a 5 a.m. wake up call at the House Majority Leader's uh, house in Harrisburg. Um, uh, that one's a golf course one. Uh, we did uh, some Christmas caroling one year. We handed out coal. Uh, that's the gift that they deserve. We have been everywhere from the offices and halls of the Capitol to the front lawns of the leadership, to their golf courses, to anywhere and everywhere where corruption is happening, to force the encounter and say, this is not okay. You need to love the people, and you can't do that while you're being blinded by these bribes. You need to earn our trust. There have been 35 gift ban bills introduced in the last 23 years. 35 gift ban bills in the last 23 years. This was a protest we did a couple years ago. Um, uh, this was the rally outside before the action. And uh, that's 74 yards worth of banner proclaiming that they have failed for 20 plus years to pass the gift ban. 35 bills in the last 23 years. The current bill, we've moved two of those out of committee in 2019 and in 2021. The current bill, and this is a major ask of all of you today, is to get your state reps signed on to House Bill 484. House Bill 484. You can go to our website right there, mohpa.org slash lobby, and there will be instructions on there of how to do this. I know a lot of you have talked with your, your legislators before, some haven't. There's instructions, um, and, and we're happy to, to walk everyone through it. We need you to call your state rep and just 
present them this simple idea. You need to co-sponsor the gift ban or else I cannot trust you. If you won't take this stand against corruption, how can I trust anything you do or say? I mean, you can't. Our second campaign, Rank Choice Voting. Join one of our Rank Choice Voting working groups. We do, uh, as Frank was saying, we've written our bill. Um, it'll be introduced soon enough. Uh, and we have plenty of policy and research work to do. We have plenty of lobbying work to do, social media, uh, speakers and endorsements. We do presentations. The next one is Monday at 7 p.m. You can find the details on our website. Please join for a one-hour program on uh, ranked choice voting and how to get more active. Um, and of course, outreach is a big part of that campaign as well. Dive into the ranked choice voting campaign. Our third campaign, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Uh, March on Harrisburg, we are a member of this, of the Poor People's Campaign. We are very active. Um, I'm a, a statewide tri-chair of, of the PPC. Uh, the PPC, the Poor People's Campaign, is nationally co-chaired by Reverend William Barber and Reverend Liz Theo Harris. And uh, we fight against the united evils of uh, the war economy, ecological devastation, systemic racism, poverty, and the distorted moral narrative of our times. We push against those fronts. We've moved forward together and not one step back. We work closely with our friends in the Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign. UU Justice PA, you'll see them up there. Thank you so, so much to our Unitarian allies. Um, you all do incredible work. These are uh, the other members of the Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign. We have Every Mother is a Working Mother, Global Women's Strike, ACT UP, uh, a Movement of Immigrant Leaders in PA, and, and so on. We work, we work together very closely, and we move all of our campaigns forward together and not one step back. You've heard me say that phrase a few times. It's very deep in the PPC. We say forward together, not one step back. Shell Oil has a plan for energy. They also have a plan on wages. They also have a plan on foreign policy. They also have a plan on infrastructure. The corporate class is incredibly united. They work very well together. Institutions like ALEC bring them together. They, they move forward together. And so we have to push back in that same moral fusion style. We have to push forward together and not one step back. We want you to join March on Harrisburg today but we would be just as happy if you joined any of these groups within the Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign. If what gets you out of bed in the morning is immigration reform, please jump into MILPA. If what gets you out of bed is healthcare, jump into Put People First. Um, Pennsylvania Action on Climate, this is our fourth campaign here. Pennsylvania Action on Climate is a coalition of anti-corruption activists and climate activists. We focus on the intersection between corruption and ecological devastation which as we've already covered is immense. That intersection is deep. The dirty money fuels the dirty policies. PAC, Pennsylvania Action on Climate, does a lot of disrupting of fundraisers, a lot of intruding into the sacred holy spaces of corrupt uh, lobbyists and politicians, forcing that encounter and demanding they stop their corruption and their ecological devastation. Pennsylvania Action on Climate is constantly doing nonviolent trainings, and uh, the nonviolent direct actions are substantial. It's a very active group. Please, please consider joining. And of course, we've only covered a couple democracy policies today. There's so much more, right? Ranked choice voting plus open primaries plus gift ban does not equal democracy. There's so much work to be done, and we're doing it. And this is our long-term legislative strategy. You can find it up on our website, our Money Out People in Policy platform. This is the roadmap that we're taking toward democracy. Things on here like abolishing the Electoral College, ending prison gerrymandering, uh, closing the revolving door, of course. There's a lot of work to do. Please don't feel overwhelmed. We do it together. We move forward together and not one step back. So please, how to plug in. Take action, take action, join us. Everybody here has a place in the democracy movement. No matter what your skill set is, no matter what your capacity is, no matter how many hours you have in the week, no matter what kind of technical skills you have, you have a place in this movement. Everybody has a place in the democracy movement. One thing we're always doing, and a good way to jump in, is jump into leadership development. Jump into the courses, jump into the classes, jump into the trainings. We develop leaders who are clear, committed, competent, capable, and confident. Jump into the leadership development, become a leader within the movement. 
The struggle is a school, and we're always learning. Plug into a working group and a chapter. It just so happens that a Western PA chapter leader, three of them are in this room right now. If they could raise their hands, uh, Andrea, Liz, and Frank. Talk to them. <laughs> Get to know them. Plug into the chapter. Once you plug into the chapter, your chapter leaders will talk with you, figure out maybe there's a working group that works for you too. Jump into a working group. Jump into more than one working group. All of the chapters and the working groups push forward together and not one step back. Mobilize. This is the next slide here. Mobilize. There's always an action to take. We try not to stress any one action because there's always more to do. Once you're organized into March on Harrisburg, there's a stream of actions to take. They're constantly changing based off of what's happening in our four campaigns. And altogether, this is a 31 event tour, uh, the Disrupt the Corrupt tour. We are gonna be everywhere in the state, from Erie to Philly, from Pittston to Westmoreland County, and everywhere in between. Anybody you know in the state of Pennsylvania can find an event near them over the next couple of months. This tour runs through the middle of June. Spread the word, spread the word, spread the word. Turn people out so we can organize people into the movement and move forward together. Build solidarity with us. Um, if you represent an organization, and a lot of people here, you're already active in, in different things, endorse us. Uh, lend support, we're happy to endorse in return, unless you're a political party, we are nonpartisan. Um, but please, uh, if you wanna become an endorsing organization, go to our website, there's a form on there with more information, please jump right in. And overall, join us. Join us, join the movement, plug into the democracy movement, take action, jump into a chapter, jump into a working group, jump into a campaign, join us. We cannot outspend the big money special interests. That's the advantage that they will always have, is that they can spend a million dollars on an election, they can spend $10 million on a propaganda outlet, they can drop incredible amounts of money whenever they want to. But what we have that they will never have is people power. And at the end of the day, as it says in Article 1, Section 2 of the Pennsylvania State Constitution, power is inherent in the people. That's the fundamental reality of our world. And we're very stuck right now in this way of thinking that, oh no, we vote for them, they go off, they have the power, they make the decisions, we don't pay attention. That's it. It is what it is. There's no way around it. At least they're being corrupt to help me. You know, that's a way that a lot of people, a lot of us think. You know, you have to be corrupt to be in the system, so maybe my corrupt bully will be the best. We don't have to live this way. We don't have to live in a corrupt system. We don't have to live in a system that bows down to idols of gold and power and sacrifices our, our lives, our health, our education. We, it doesn't have to be this way. We're stuck right now. Let's unstick. Let's move forward together. We don't need to, to be living this way. We need to be waging peace, and waging peace with the same scale, duration, and intensity with which we're all used to waging war. If the United States of America is attacked by a foreign enemy, we can have half a million people halfway across the world within a couple days, and they'll be there for a couple decades. That's the type of scale, intensity, and duration with which we wage war. We need to become peace warriors. We need to wage peace. We need to fight with nonviolent campaigns, and we need to move forward. I'll just close us out with one more thought here. Two more thoughts. <laughs> one, this is very important, this is a logistical thing. Join Slack, join Slack. I know some people here might say, oh, I don't wanna join another app. Oh, what's the point of downloading just another thing? Slack is how we talk. Slack is our internal communication platform. Slack is where all of our chapters and our working groups are. It's where our work is being moved forward day by day. It's where we share our documents. It's where everything happens. Please join Slack. If you're technologically challenged, it happens. There's no shame in that. It's just reality. Uh, we have a great Slack training that we will walk you through. Please do not let that be a burden. Please do join Slack. If you scan that QR code, it'll take you to our Slack. Um, if you sign up online, you'll get an email inviting you to Slack. If you're confused at all about any of this, 
please approach Frank, Liz, or Andrea, and they will help plug you into our Slack. It is, very, it, it is the heartbeat of, of our organization. It's how we communicate with each other. Second logistical thing, sorry. Um, donate. i got to make a donation pitch. Uh, we, we do run on, uh, on, on uh, supporters uh, like you. Um, please make a donation. Um, outside, there's a, a box, and there's also a, a website to go to to make a donation online. It's also up on our website. Um, God, we, we do not make a lot of money. Uh, don't worry. Nothing will go to waste. Um, as March on Harrisburg, I, I've been everywhere in this state many, many times over, as have a lot of us. We have only actually ever paid for lodging once, uh, just to put that out there. It was an emergency situation in Belfont where we got an Airbnb for a night. Other than that, we don't pay for our lodging. We, we rely on the hospitality of, of our network. We rely on movement strength, and we are extremely frugal with, with our funds. Uh, so please, please do donate and know that it's, it's not going to go to the day's end. Uh, that's for sure. Okay, let's close out with Article 1, Section 2 of the Pennsylvania State Constitution. This is our holy, sacred text as Pennsylvanians. This is our state constitution, and this is what it says about the purpose of government and how this is all supposed to work. It reads, all power is inherent in the people, and all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. For the advancement of these ends, they have at all times an inalienable, and indefeasible right to alter, reform, or abolish their government in such manner as they may think proper. The major takeaway from today is that power is not inherent in the people in our lived reality. It's not. But it should be, and it needs to be, and it's our right and our obligation to make it so. So please join the democracy movement, get active, get involved, and let's move forward together and not one step back. Thank you.